In my presentation, I am going to use a lot of photos. Uh, very few of the photos have been uh, taken by me. So I thank uh, the people uh, who has taken the photos, some of them my friends and some of them actually unknown. Uh, so just to say it up front. No? So I think this is a, a very simple form of memory of people trying to remember uh, in various ways. Oh, so this is another uh, simple form of memory. Uh, these uh, photos that I got from two families uh, near Mulankavil about how they try to keep the memory of their family members who were killed in the last stage of the war. And in many of the houses that I have visited in the northern province, I have seen such photos. So I think when we talk of memory, we are talking about uh, very deeply uh, personal tragedies, uh, which has unfortunately become very immensely political. And that's why we have terms like the politics of memory. And now this has also become the subject of research, academic studies, and discussions. Uh, but essentially, this is something very, very personal. And I would also like to say that you know, the right to memory is just one component of transitional justice process when we look at it in a perspective of rights to truth, justice, reparation, and guarantees of uh, non-occurrence. So I will share. Uh, some experiences from Sri Lanka in general. Uh, I want to share a little bit about obstructions we have faced in Sri Lanka, particularly in the recent past, in terms of memory. I want to share some thoughts about tourism and memory. Uh, and then I want to discuss a little bit about commemorating, are we trying to commemorate heroes or villains, or are there blurred lines between these two? And also some concluding reflections and questions. So some experiences in Sri Lanka. So the JVP. Uh, has something called the April Heroes Commemoration, April Viru Samarua, to mark the first JVP insurrection of 1971. This is the most recent one, just one month ago, the poster advertising that event. And that has gone on for 44 years, as the invitation itself, a uh, public poster, uh, explains. And the terminology they have used is, in that poster, in Sinhalese, is a great defeat, but unending aim. Shrest Parajya Numiyana Aramuna. So these are some of the revolutionaries who have survived. No, I think some of you may know some of them. You know, there is one called Uyumahatya, Podiyatula, and Ashoka. Uh, not the lady. Uh, so the, the three men are survivors of the 1971 insurrection. And I will leave you to try to imagine who they are now. No? The JVP also has a November Heroes commemoration. Il Mahaviru Samarua, since 1989, November killing of the JVP leader, Rohana Vijayavira. And to take some lines uh, from the JVP website, that is to commemorate heroes who laid down their lives for the motherland, including the founder of the party, a comrade Rona Vijayavira, and will be celebrated by the JVP. So this is the terminology that the JVP uses in their public posters and public invitations. And this has also gone on for uh, 25 years. They also have it abroad. And this is the invitation for the last one in London. One of the uh, strong experiences or efforts in Sri Lanka for me uh, to remember, to have memory, is the monument for the disappeared at Radulu near the Katnaika airport. So these are, that is the monument itself. Uh, this is the image of uh, families of disappeared people and families of people killed who go there, uh, particularly on October 27th, but also on other days. I have been there on other days, and on, at least on one occasion, on a so-called normal day, I have seen one lady coming alone to lay flowers there. But this is the beginning. Here also you might see some uh, character there uh, who you might recognize now in a totally different role. Uh, but this is the beginning. No? At the beginning, there were 16 people to start this commemoration. There was no big building or monument like it there is now. And it was held under a lot of repression. No, that is why there were many priests uh, who went there in a way to provide the cover. There was a Buddhist monk. And that Buddhist monk also, I don't know whether you'll recognize, that's Baddegama Samita who also uh, quite a well-known personality uh, these days. And I will leave you to look into what his politics and positions are about memory nowadays. But I want to emphasize that this was started in a very, very difficult environment, you know, under a lot of repression. There are 16 people gathered around. 
and it has gone on now for 25 years. Every year on October 27th, uh, it will happen again this year, I believe. And in the last several years, we had many families of disappeared people from the north and east, and some members of civil society from the north and east also joining in. Although this is essentially still a, a monument, a commemoration for Sinhalese people who disappeared and were killed. And the place is also where this person, Lionel, uh, was body was found after being disappeared, after being abducted. And the initiative was taken by his girlfriend, Jayanti. That's how something like this started. Uh, this, of course, is a more better known commemoration of a better known personality, uh, the editor of the Sunday Leader, Lasanta Vikramatunga. Uh, this is a more recent photo. Some of you may have been here. You know, commemoration of Tamil journalists killed uh, just a few days ago. If you have been to Udayan, the Udayan is a mini museum, a very bloody museum. Uh, they have a room where they have memories. They preserve the memories of Udayan employees that have been killed or have been abducted or have been assaulted and injured seriously, also on the attacks on the institution itself. And they will also take you around, if you are uh, interested, uh, to show the machinery that has been burnt down. I don't know, maybe someone from Udayan is here. So this is from Bankale in Mena, remembering a Catholic priest who was killed on 6th of January 1985 in Mena. And that commemoration has been going on for almost 30 years now, since 1985, every year. And it's considered a black day in Bankale, which is essentially a fishing village. And people don't go to fish on that day in memory of this priest who was killed. Uh, this is a photo of Neelan Tirushelvam, who was killed in July 1999 in Colombo. Every year, there's a road painting that happens uh, to remember. And of course, after some months, that gets erased because it's a main busy road. And there's also a small monument, which is almost uh, uh, difficult to see nowadays, but it's still there. So this is uh, another part of commemorating Neelan Tirushalvam. Every year, there's a commemorative lecture uh, where usually someone from abroad comes to deliver a lecture on a topic related to human rights, democracy, reconciliation. And there's also every year, separately, a cultural event to remember Neelan Tiruchalvam. Uh, there's also a monument for Buddhist monks who were massacred in Arantalawa in June 1987. So this is one such uh, monument. And uh, that one there says, uh, points the way to the monument for the uh, monks or monuments for the Buddhist monks. Uh, this is how the people in the Katangudi mosque try to remember the Muslims who were massacred in 1990 in two mosques in Katangudi. Uh, this is still there. This photo was taken uh, last year, late last year by me. So these are two separate photos in the two different mosques. This is still preserved. So this is a, a notice uh, remembering that uh, incident. And these are a list of people who were killed in that mosque, in the two mosques that were attacked. That is still there today, after 25 years. Uh, this is an effort by northern Muslims who were evicted from the northern province in 1990 to remember their story. It came out in the form of a publication called The Quest for Redemption, the story of northern Muslims. And this is part of the process, the consultations, the interviews, the research process that happened. So all this, to some extent, was, has been tolerable. That is why these things have happened. And that is why these things are still there. And that is why we can still see those things. And that is why we can still take those photos. But it's important to also to talk about uh, what appears to be not tolerable. What memory appears not to be tolerable in Sri Lanka? So that is why I want to come to the question of uh, obstructions to memory. So this is something very recent. Summons issued a few days ago uh, to a member of the Northern Provincial Council to come to the police station in Mulatiu regarding lighting of lamps at home commemorate LTT heroes on 27th of November 2014. So more than six months later, he's been summoned to come, and this is the summons in Sinhalese. No, that was delivered to his house. And it says specifically where to come and when to come. It's very reason. So these two attempts to remember what happened uh, in, on 18th of May in Vanni, uh, these were photos also taken by me. Uh, that is in uh, Urujirapuram, outside the Catholic Church. These two monuments are there. One is for a Catholic priest who died on 18th of May, Father Sarah. Uh, he died because of the circumstances surrounding the war and the situation there. It was not natural death as such. Uh, and this is in the Kovil uh, in Kilnochi on that day, where 
families of people who had disappeared and families of people who were killed went to have a puja. And then there were a lot of obstructions or intimidation that happened in relation to these two events. In the past, uh, even keeping photos in houses of people killed have been obstructed. And there has been military personnel who have gone to houses and instructed or ordered people to remove photographs. And I have been told by family members who experienced that. This is a monument uh, that was put up by students, I believe, in the University of Jaffna, which has been destroyed by the army in the Jaffna University. I don't know the status of this. I haven't been there uh, for several years. I think I took this photo, if I remember, in 2007 and eight, or seven or eight. Uh, this is also a photo that I took some time back when we go to eat ice cream in Rio, uh, nearby there. You know, we can see the destroyed statue of a LTT political leader who fast to death. Uh, back a long time ago, and this was the, how it was in 2010. Of course, you can't even see the ruins now, if you go now. Uh, this is a remaining memorial in a, that I took a photograph in uh, September 2011 in Konawe. If you go today, both these are not there. I have been there uh, afterwards in 2012, 2013, and both these have gone. I don't know how this particular one managed to survive till 2011, September, but it had survived. But it, it has not survived after 2011. So this is a common site, a destroyed LTT militants memorial in Mulankavil. Uh, this was how it was. I think I took this photo in 2010 or 11. Uh, but of course now it's uh, later converted into a small army camp. So I dare not take photographs of it now. So this is a something called the Shrine of Innocence or Ahimsake Ange Aramya. It was built in memory of those disappeared, killed in 1987-1989. In, in the insurrection in the south. Uh, it was built at the invitation of the then president, uh, Madam Chandrika Kumaratunga, uh, under state patronage. Uh, it was destroyed in 2011. And it was destroyed to build this photo that you see there. Maybe some of you may go there and have something to eat or drink. Be careful what you might taste. Uh, and, uh, and how interestingly the Sunday Observer described it. Uh, did this photo as an artist struggling underwater holding a picture of the Shrine of Innocence, which was demolished to create Dieta Vienna, meaning water garden uh, in general, in the process of development, the beautification of the Colombo city. So the history of obstructions is also sadly very rich in Sri Lanka, as I understand. As I understand, the LTT didn't allow commemorations of rival armed groups and of incidences where they stand accused. The JVP didn't even allow proper funerals for those they killed during the way insurrections that they waged. I remember very well uh, in 1989 when someone in our village, uh, city, town that I am staying was killed by the JVP. They ordered the funeral to be held below the knee, you know, not carried here like we usually do, the, the, the body of the, the person. The government of Sri Lanka has tried to block some commemorations and in 2000, since 2009 May, the government has become the very dominant actor. Uh, no strong armed groups present. Uh, the destruction of the cemeteries of the LTT carders and other monuments has happened after that. The arrest, threats, intimidation, harassments of those organizing and participating in commemorations has happened. Obstruction to even funerals, of, for example, of Nimala Ruben, a Tamil political prisoner who was killed in 2012, and Roshan Chanaka, a Sinhalese worker who was killed in the, during a protest in the free trade zone, also happened under the regime of the Rajapaksas. And of course, there has been resistance to government intimidations and obstructions. Uh, the example I cited at the beginning, in 1990, the beginning of a disappearances commemoration that led to the monument started under a uh, lot of repression. And it was a act of defiance at that time for 16 people to gather together to do that commemoration. And of course, there has been acts of defiance and resistance in the north, some of which I tried to capture before. So this has happened very regularly. Arrests, threats, intimidations, obstructions, restrictions on remembering in the north and east by the military, by the police and politicians has intensified after the war in 2010 until 2014. And especially on 18th of May, which is the end of the war, and 27th of November, which has traditionally been celebrated as Mahavir Great Heroes Day by the LTT. So it left to be seen what will happen in one week's time on 18th of May 2015 under Yahapalaneya or good governance. Uh, left to be seen what will happen in 2015 November. I want to share brief thoughts about uh, tourism and memory. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as dark tourism. 
Uh, also because tourism has become a big thing in the last several years in Sri Lanka, and I'm sure you see far more tourists in Jaffna and in the northern province and the eastern provinces in the last several years. So if we think of overseas, no, some of the mainstream tourist attractions are related to memory of terrible things that happen. So this is an interesting museum. If you go to Washington, D.C., it's about uh, journalists and freedom of expression. It's a huge museum. You can look at it for two days. In fact, the ticket they issue is quite expensive, but it's valid for two days, meaning that one day may not necessarily be enough to see. No, I spent almost the whole day there from morning till evening. And some of the Sri Lankan journalists who have been killed, a few of them are also featured there you know, in the journalist memorial. That is only one section. Uh, this, of course, is well-known uh, Holocaust Memorial, or switch, and this is where uh, you know, millions of people, millions of tourists go. And this is not only in uh, uh, these places, but it is even in other places, like in, even if you go to South Africa or US, England, many places you can find Holocaust memorials. Uh, this is from South Africa, uh, where there's an apartheid museum and many others, and they try to even provide an experience of the discrimination that people of different colors had to undergo in the way you enter. You know, even when I went there, uh, when you enter, I had to go through a separate queue. I went with another person who was white, and then that person had to go through another entrance. You know? So they tried to give us that experience. Uh, this is from Rwanda, and I think uh, many of us, if not been, have heard of uh, what happened in Rwanda. There are many museums and memorials in South Africa and Rwanda. These are just one. Uh, this is from Cambodia, you know, where one of the worst uh, prisons and torture chambers is now a museum. And this is a photo of uh, school students in Cambodia visiting that. Uh, this is uh, from Northern Ireland, Derry. Uh, this is a bit of an interesting initiative because these two initiatives are run by uh, people who are affected by what they call the troubles, or the human rights violations and the tensions, violence that happened during that time. So this is a museum, uh, the Free Dairy Museum, that is run by uh, survivors. Uh, that is a walk uh, where tourists can go around in the, uh, the area called Bogzai, where a lot of tensions, violence happened in Northern Ireland. And that also is led by people who survived, so they can relate very personally what they went through during that time to tourists who go there. So this is very much mainstream tourism. In any tourist brochure, you will find these things if you go to these places. Of course, Sri Lanka has also, particularly in the northern province, had our share of tourism, particularly in 2011, 12, 13, I think. Uh, this is not there now, but this was there in 2012 and 13 at the Putukudi Rupu Junction. This was manned by the army. You know, and this gives an indication of where the famous tour, uh, tour sites are. Many of you will not be able to read it uh, because it's in English and singly. So it shows that to whom the tourists, the targeted tourists were. Uh, so this is one example of the tourism that happened in Sri Lanka. It was primarily meant for Sinhalese. And I've seen that many times, and most of the tourists were from the south in Sinhalese. And the tour guides were from the military in uniform. So this is again the announcement. Uh, uh, says a lot of things. Uh, these are information centers in Putukudi Yuppu and uh, Gilinochu respectively. So there are many other examples, so I just be, picked a few samples. No? Uh, one question that I want to raise uh, you know, as I come to my conclusion is the idea of whether we are commemorating heroes or villains, or whether there are blurred lines uh, between these two. So this is something that we will see on the main road near Elephant Pass. No? It's called in Sinhalese Hasalaka Viriya. Hasalaka hero. It refers to a soldier in the Sri Lankan army uh, who, according to the army's narrative, sacrificed his life by jumping into this uh, armored car of the LTT and saved uh, many soldiers' lives in a camp, army camp at that time. A very long time ago. I don't remember exactly the, the year. So, and this is his uh, memorial, and I think many of you would have seen this. It's a big tourist attraction now. And that is uh, his mother who has come to lay flowers at the son's uh, memorial at the monument. You know, and that's the uh, senior army officer greeting the mother and other family members. And of course, this uh, mother's son uh, served in an institution or a unit that is responsible for horrendous abusers that we all know about. I don't know whether this person himself was responsible, but the, certainly the institution that person was part of, and the institution that is commemorating and doing all this, certainly was responsible for terrible abusers for decades. So what do we do? How do we do with, deal with this? It's also the same to some extent, no, with, uh, in terms of the LTT. 
So these again is pictures of family members of the LTT going to the the martyr cemeteries at that time. Of course, these are not there now. These have been bulldozed. But they too have been responsible for terrible abuses, horrendous abuses. Some of which I captured in my previous slides. You no, know, at the beginning. So how do we deal with that? Hero to some is a villain to another. But both are sons and daughters, or husband or wife, or brother and sister to some family members. So these are some other monuments that have been built for the military. Again, I have personally met at these sites when I went, families of some soldiers. So for them, this is a way to remember the glorious deeds, the, the very good things that their sons or maybe a few daughters had done. So some concluding reflections and maybe some questions. Now, Sri Lanka has a history of memorialization, as I tried to explain and trace in the past. No? The JVP, the LTT, and the government all try to honor their political leaders and their cadres. And there have been massacres that has happened that are being tried to remember. Satrakondan in Batiklo, Katankudi Mosque, Arantalawa, a few examples that I know of where some commemorations still happen. And some, there is some memory, some remembrance in a physical form. Uh, there have been other efforts of collective incidences like the ex expulsion of the northern Muslims. There are particular individuals that are commemorated like Neelan Tirushalvam, Lasanta Vikram Tunga, Rajani Tirunagama, Father Jim Brown, Father Mary Bastian, etc. Uh, to a certain extent, these people are what I would call maybe certain prominent personalities. Uh, and also, we unfortunately, Sri Lanka has a rich history of obstructions to memory and remembrance. Uh, and then, uh, links to the tourism. Usually, the, this in Sri Lanka in the last several years has by run party, by run by one party that stands accused of many of the abusers, namely the military. So the how to ensure the plurality of narratives to tourists and the general public is a big challenge, I think, in Sri Lanka, if we think of doing dark tourism and linking memory to tourism in Sri Lanka. And also trying to ensure the educative aspect and the retention of history. And how to ensure that victims, their families, and local communities are involved in the design, implementation, decision making, and even benefiting, including financially, from the tourism that will happen. So some, these are just some possible approaches that I have seen, no official ones, and also we can have popular ones, the ones in Raddalua and many of the other commemorations that happen in different parts, which I mentioned before, are popular ones or civil initiatives. Uh, some of the monuments are for individuals, small monuments for individuals, and also collective ones. Uh, there is uh, efforts to retain damaged or destroyed buildings. This morning I went to the mass. Uh, I'm a Catholic, so I went for mass in the morning to the cathedral. Uh, and I remember that uh, many years ago, not many years actually, you know, about four or five years ago, all the bullet holes were very visible in the cathedral. Today, it is not visible. It has been whitewashed by like the library, I think. No? Uh, so retaining the sites of tragedy, like some of the prisons in Cambodia, in South Africa, in a different form. In South Africa, one of the worst uh, prisons where political prisoners were held and tortured is now a remembrance site called Constitutional Hill. Uh, there have been online efforts. The Asian Human Rights Commission uh, ran what I know to be one of the earliest online efforts at memorialization, I think in the late 90s, or at least in 2000, what they called the cyber graveyard for the disappeared. I tried to look for it. It's no longer there. You know, so, and then there's also efforts by Tamil groups to have Mahavir Illams, and there's one online. There are special days. There are commemorative lectures, there are cultural activities, changing history in school books, and having historical narratives. And I think one example that I can get from Sri Lanka is the Northern Muslims uh, initiative, and also if I cite something from outside, the recovery of historical memory project by the Catholic Church in Guatemala. So this is a, a screenshots of this Mahavir Illams online effort by, I think, some Tamil groups. Uh, I don't know who runs it, actually, but it is online for everyone to see. Uh, the recovery of historical memory project in Guatemala was a long process, uh, as the name uh, says it, after the dictatorship. It was a private effort, or a civil effort, because it was by the Catholic Church, not by the government. And this, I don't know whether you will guess what this photo is. This photo is the uh, funeral of the bishop who was the pioneer of that. He was killed two days after the report was released. So memory or memorialization can be bloody business. So this is an effort called Gaza Monologues. This was actually shown in Colombo about the, the war that happened in Gaza uh, in 2009. 
And interestingly, that was shown in Colombo, although things that happened in Sri Lanka itself was not shown in Colombo in an effort like this. So I think the challenges for us, which I kind of questions that I want to leave with, is how to have inclusive remembering versus exclusive remembering. Considering victims from different ethnic religious groups, but also by different perpetrators. Do we want to remember only groups, particular groups of victims who are victimized by a particular group, or do we want to remember all victims, irrespective of who they are and irrespective of the perpetrators? Should we commemorate those who have engaged in abusers and violence? And if so, how should we do it? No, and should we do it in uh, groups or should we do it in indi as individuals? And should we have private commemorations versus public commemorations? Because this is something that the former government told us in some occasions that no, you can have private commemorations, but no public and collective commemorations. And I think the, for me, the challenge of discussing victims and perpetrators, sometimes the lines are very blurred. And whether the challenge of also seeing perpetrators as human beings, you know, with mothers, fathers, possibly children, spouses, brothers and sisters. And also whether there is any way that we can explore that commemoration, memorialization can be done in a way that will enable perpetrators also to reconcile with themselves you know, and their families and their victims and recover their humanity and try to move on. So I will leave with this. I already played the song. Initially, I thought I'll play the song at the end. So thank you very much.